everybody, this is Dr. Regina Bradley and this is Outcasted Conversations number 16, sweet 16. So All right. We on location. We doing this location thing, right? We uh we in the A shouted. We at Welcome All Park and I got my friend with me, the one and only Mr. Afro, the Shell Toes himself, Mr. Act Gons. What's going on, good What's son? up, good people? Glad to join Outcasted Conversations. Outcasted you know? Conversations. Since I just had a pole boy, I felt we were spitting <laughs> that we do it out here in the park, okay? Indeed, indeed. So we out here in the park. It's gorgeous outside. You know, so you know what you got to do to, to get into the club. You get know what I'm saying? Club. How did you become outcasted? Okay, let me take you back. All right. Way back. Way back. <laughs> when it used to be High Tower Road, Frederick Douglass High School. All right. Frederick Douglass High School. I had a friend. We were in Spanish class, and they had the headphones. It wasn't Beats by Dre. You know the little headphones? They had that piece of wire that just always messed up. So they played Southern Player Listing, and I lost my mind. Yeah. And I lost my mind because I heard people that sounded like me. So right. it's cool to talk at the Georgia slang and the Atlanta slang now, but back then, to hear two folks that was unapologetically Southern blew my mind. Mm. And then the other thing that initiated me into into the into the book of outcasts mm -hmm. was that um, there was a brother named Arnell Starr that I think had a show called American Music Makers. And he did a behind the scenes video shoot of Southern Player List. Oh, that's dope. That's All right? dope. I think it was at MBK. A lot of people don't know, you know, people like the front on P. Diddy, Puffy, or Sean Combs, but mm -hmm. he directed that video. Oh. And so, um, that video really crystallized it. You had, you know, the pimp aesthetic. Everybody's granddad and uncle wanted a Cadillac. Mm. Um, so, you know what I'm saying? If you didn't have one, you borrowed somebody. Right, right. So, um, that was my initiation into uh, being outcasted. No, that's that's dope. That's dope. I mean, so you're from the A. You're, you're from, from the A. You're from yes. here. So, you know, I talked to uh, Maurice Garland a couple oh, yeah. of weeks ago. Um, so Shout what out, you, brother Maurice. Yeah, you know, so... You know, what is your take on when Outcast first dropped? You know what I'm saying? Do you think that the city really knew what they had on their hands? Or did I, really think, feel I like think people, people, you know, there was a mixed crowd, but I would say more people than you would, than, than you know, how legend changes. Right, You know, right, right. I think the legend might say, well, everybody wasn't feeling Outcast. It was a good pack of people that felt Outcast. Like, you know, I was telling you before, I, I grew up five minutes from Headland and Delope. Mm -hmm. Okay, my mama got perch fillet and catfish on Fridays from the low <laughs> fish market. Okay, so to hear Helen in the low shouted out, mm -hmm. to hear East Point shouted out, you know, because when you say you're from Atlanta, people see your license as East Point. They're like, where's East Point? Mm -hmm. Outcast did something by putting people on the map that were Southern, that were articulate, mm -hmm. and it gave you a rap hero. Right. Okay, before okay. that, we had East Coast. You know, if you if you was, you know, I, I have spray painted. I have been a B-boy. I have DJ. You done know, it all. I've done the cardboard in the driveway. Mm -hmm. So to have a hero in hip-hop from my neighborhood. Right. You know what I'm saying? You could see outcasts in the food court of Greenbrier Mall with Goody Mob, CeeLo, T, you know, uh, everybody. Mm -hmm. And just mm -hmm. to see regular folks still be humble and be on a national stage, it, it gave you like a sense of pride. To me, what Outkast did with that first album and with their career is what Invisible Man did for Black Identity. Woo! Okay. Excuse me you for putting so, Ellison so what, in Yeah, there. so we gotta throw Ellison in there mm -hmm. because what they did, there was a vi an invisibility for Southern Black manhood. A mm. lot of times when you saw Southern Black manhood, it was a step and fetch it image. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times, Southern black men are more associated with slavery than our Northern brothers. So here you have them creating a visible spot for the Southern black man to articulate his worldview, that his slang is now accepted. Well, I mean, it, it complicates what Southernness means. You know what I'm saying? I mean, mm -hmm. when you're thinking about like Ellison and Wright and all them boys, or those men, excuse me, you know, black, black, old black men don't yeah, like you, to yeah, call don't, boys. You can't say don't, no boys, so, yeah. no boys. Apologize to the elders. Y'all don't like boys. <laughs> I feel you. It's a struggle. But, I mean, I think, I, think that's, I think that's dope because it's like it actually gives the opportunity for Southern black men to be complex. Yes. You know what I'm saying? You're not necessarily just a pimp. You're not necessarily just a philosopher. Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily just a step and fetch it, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a good, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of the, the work that you do in the community. So okay. you... 
you have uh, from Afros to Shell Toes. Yes. You want to tell folks about what that okay, is a little from bit? from Afros to Shell Toes is nothing but me bridging the generation now. Okay. So it's, it, it's, it's cultural production, so whether we're doing art, music, literature, whether we're developing curriculums, I sipping sweet tea and talking, you know, over potato chips with Dr. Cornel West and, and my brother Cliff West and Mike Daly. Um, we are all about bridging the generational divide in everything that we do. Mm. You know, we also attack class because those two of the big issues that I see in the black community is the class issue, mm -hmm. uh, also um, intergenerational healing and dialogue. Okay. So that's what From Afro to Shell Toes is all about. Now the heartbeat of From Afro to Shell Toes is Sweet Tea Ethics. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Ethics. So Sweet Tea Ethics um, would be, in, in, it's a philosophy. Mm. Okay, so the heartbeat is Sweet Tea Ethics, and it's also a program that we've done. Uh, we've done radio shows with Sweet Tea Ethics. I had Sweet Tea Ethics Radio a couple of years ago. So we are celebrating about um, about 12 years now oh, from Afro to Shell Toast. And how Sweet Tea Ethics relates to this outcasted conversation, that's the Sweet Tea Ethics aesthetic is what Outcast's work is all about. Mm. You have a mix of formal education. Yep. Southern sensibility and right, ethics. Right. You have some grandma training. That, that, and then, that poach lesson. Yeah, that, that, yeah the, po the porch constituency is right, there. Right. But you know that these brothers are educated not just in the book sense. Yes. That they have found a way to communicate their where of you using their grandma gut and common sense. And that's what Sweet Tea Ethics is all about. So, okay, we're going to have to take a quick sidestep because, okay. you know, when we talk about sweet tea, Yes. You know, there's, there's a particular, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm bougie about my tea. Yes, I am I'm, too. I'm bougie about the tea. I am too. So, I mean, you know, like, but the, <laughs> all jokes aside, I'm really fascinated by the idea of using Outcast mm -hmm. to teach this type of ethical understanding of, of the world that's going around us, right? Yeah. Um, You know, so with, so with, you know, sweet tea ethics, this idea of sweet tea ethics, what do you think that really kind of stems from... Historically, because you talked about like the the front porch ethics, okay, talking about right. grandma stuff like that. So let me let me so, let me go that? there. You know, since outcasting conversations, we have to dabble in the academy and the intellectual. I dabbled let, a little bit. Let, let's go here. Okay, Richard Wright, blueprint for Negro writing, okay. where he talks about that tension between the upper class Negro, which is considered the bourgeoisie, and the common folks. You know, talking about black organizations that are no longer serving the people. Right. And he's also talking about that disenchantment that we have as black people that are spiritual, but we still getting our tails kicked. Mm. Okay, so mm. when we look at the blueprint for Negro writing, we can relate that to outcasts because they deal with that tension head on. They're from East Point. They're not from Cascade. Okay. They are from around my way, around the corner with the Tri-Cities High School. They didn't go to Maine. You know, we know... We know the connotations behind going to Tri-City at this time. Mm. You know, Tri-City is labeled to be the hood school, but they have, you know, one of the greatest communication programs mm. out right now. A lot now. of talent came out of Tri-City. A lot of though. talent came out of Tri-City. Mm. So you have that tension there if you're looking at historically of how Outcast fits. Right. And then you also look at um, Brother Langston Hughes and um, the Negro artists and the racial mountain. Right. A lot of outcast works deals with black identity. Mm -hmm. And it deals with that notion of what does it mean to be black? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to communicate in the space to the world as a black person? Not just what it means to be black, though, but what it means to be Southern and black yeah, after the civil rights movement. Yeah, because yeah. Um, historically, you know, we look at, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, in the South, we are not given props for being intellectuals. You know, people right. forget that W.E. Du Bois right there in, it's called the Atlanta University Center, now it's Atlanta University, mm -hmm. that, you know, he was there. Right. You right. know, so Atlanta holds a cultural place, but I think over time people have forgotten the deep history of that, like the Royal Peacock, you know, with Gladys Knight and Ray Charles and different people performing there. So I think historically their in the tradition of those great artists and do things that uh, great artists do. When I look at unappreciated songs from outcasts like the 13th floor growing old on, on ATL is. Right. They're basically talking about maturing mm -hmm. and what it means to mature in a society that has limited views of black men and more specifically as you would say southern black men mm -hmm. and then you look at you know like ATL is was just the biggest project for me on opening up you know, black identity does not have a lot of elasticity. Mm. We're stuck in a certain point. What ATLians does is that 
they're using the alien metaphor because that's how we were looked at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were looked at as something foreign. So just that metaphor of AT Alias takes us to a different place because it's easy to discount the first album as some pimp player stuff. Right. You right. know, that only a certain hood can understand, but we see that they are not afraid to evolve. Because one of the things we as black people are scared of and fearful of is evolution. Mm. You come with an evolutionary idea, a revolutionary idea, and see how much support you're going to get right away. So I think that LT Aliens makes that tone shift that is necessary for Outkast to exist. I think without coming with AT Aliens second, that Outkast might have been wiped off the map and just considered a one hit one. Oh, wow. Okay. That's how significant that album is to me. So let's, talk, let's, let's go a little bit back to what you're talking about this idea of um, cultural activism. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really important, especially in these kind of marginalized, oppressed spaces. Yeah. I think the challenge now is that Atlanta's not necessarily that same marginalized space that we were thinking about 20 years ago. You know what I'm saying? Um, if you come to Atlanta, it's pretty much a, a hub for music, especially hip hop yeah. music. So, when we think about the idea of the sweet tea ethics, and we yeah. think about you know from Afro to Shoto, how does your project kind of reinvigorate that idea of having cultural activism in, in the South? Well, what it does is that it takes the grandmama lessons and put it on the front line. Okay. Like grandmother, a lot of times was an activist mm -hmm. in the South. Either she was on the front lines right, or, because of, or because she had to take care of her family. Mm -hmm. She was in the house cooking chicken, so her revolution came in the kitchen. Okay? You know what I'm saying? Because, because, you know, I think about my grandmother, okay. Elizabeth, like the late Elizabeth Flo, revolutionary. You know, she grew up in, in Hazelhurst, Georgia, near Savannah, dropped out, of, dropped out of high school. She's the smartest woman I know. Mm -hmm. And the revolution happened in the kitchen. All right, so with, with, with from Afro to Shantos, what we do is we take tenets of grandmother and the civil rights movement and re-articulate those visions in a contemporary space. Okay. So what happens is when I get with uh, Kevin Powell and other leaders and we do Katrina on the ground, you know, we're going to have a, a, a contemporary sensibility, but we still going to take it to the Edmund Pettus, Pettus Bridge. We're going to show kids their history. We're going to train them. Like with Katrina on the ground, we trained over seven or 800 students on how to deal with the issue of Katrina, not only in a, in a physical space, the mm. physical devastation, but I was like a counseling resident that dealt with the mental devastation. Okay. So we're taking those tenants that our grandmother gave us and we are remixing. You know, a great example of that is, I think about our brother, how we met, Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, in that wonderful TED talk he did on W.E. Du Bois' Souls of Black Folks, the first black women. So, like, we are taking those same tenets and making it palatable to this generation because it's really about how you speak to folks. Mm. So what Outkast did, the vernacular that they're using was the vernacular of people their age, right. but it was built on grandmother. Uh, it was built on civil rights principles, but black liberation theology is throughout the world. And shout out to Big Boy's Aunt Renee, because that's where he said the kitchen logic yeah, took place. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, let's, um, let's, let's switch a little bit. I'm really interested in your idea of this idea of mentor. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, and not necessarily just outcast, you know what I'm saying? Just the whole idea of the dungeon family, right? Yes. And, that, and that family unit, that whole idea of having, like, the play play cousins. Mm -hmm. and, you know, everybody got play cousins or that play auntie, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, what? How does how does Outkast reemphasize that that need for family that, that that need for family not necessarily just blood family but chosen family as well? Well, Outkast uh, represents uh, the collectivist spirit, you know, in the black community. Like okay. when I think about Outkast and the Dungeon family, I think about my mentor, Dr. Joseph White, who's considered the godfather of black psychology, and I think about some of the psychological trends he talks about with black folks with the Dungeon family. You're going to have what Dr. White talks about, improvisation. Okay. You're going to have resilience. You're going to have some spirituality. You're going to have a healthy suspicion of white folks. You're going to have a, you're going to have a gallows sense of humor. But that's what Dr. White talks about. These principles I'm naming are some of the psychological strengths that we just embody as black people. What the Dungeon family does, it gives outcasts a support to go out in the system mm. as southern black men. Okay. So one of the underappreciated mentors um, in the outcast situation for me is Big Root. Like everyone, very has, underrated. Every, everyone plays their part, and the reason B B Big Root and I used to work at the same publication, so I've had 
a chance to just sit and rap with him mm -hmm. and talking about how like with crumbling herb when they right. were making the song like hey you know pulling outcast aside like yo we got to make some other revolutionary stuff on top of that mm -hmm. so that's how you get with big rube you get you know niggas killing niggas they don't understand right. what's the master plan i'm just crumbling herb so it becomes not just smoking weed you can almost put some rastafarian behind it because it's a of the of spiritual it's a, it's a it's a spiritual reflection there mm -hmm. so that's what big rules mentorship does and we're from afros to shell toes the mentoring component is important because we've lost it mm -hmm. like at the barber shop if you got out of line, if you said something disrespectful to want to women, somebody checked you. Mm -hmm. In the barber shop now, you got the elders acting like cheery. <laughs> Not okay? cheery. You got granddad, and it's no disrespect to tennis shoes, but I remember I interviewed Raphael Sadiq, and he said we lost our way as black people when older black men stopped wearing hard bottom shoes. Oh wow! And so what he talks about in that interview that we had is how you can trace. The, uh, the the desperation of the black community and things between father and son changing when you couldn't hear your father walking in in hard bottom shoes. Now that is true though. That is true because I know when my papa would come home, <laughs> I did something I wasn't supposed to do. Got a little nervous when I heard that click clack. Yeah, when you hear that. <laughs> but see, my granddaddy had Stacy Adams, and he did them Stacy Adams dress boots. So you knew when he got home from his little hangout, it was home. So, <laughs> you know, and I'm just going to keep that off record because, you know, he has some choice words for us. But the mentorship component, that's what you see in Outcast, And that's what we bring to the table from Afro to Shell Toast. It's no way from Afro to Shell Toast exists without Dr. Joseph White, without Dr. Cornell West, his brother Clifton West, without Mark Daly, mm -hmm. without Dr. Michael Woodard, without my father, my grandfather. My aunt Bobby, who had a juke joint in Vicksburg, Mississippi, because people think mentorship is not gender specific. I learned a lot, you know, from from sisters too. Uh, Dr. Robbie Stewart, uh, that was my mentor at Michigan State, that's that's moved on to another university. So that mentorship component is where you find yourself. Mm. When you get out of line, you got a big roof to pull you back. When you when your beat's not working, you got organized noise. You know what I'm saying? Ray Murray. You got everybody. Right, right. You got everybody behind you. Uh, Rico Wade. So that mentorship was essential in all of the things that they were going to have to deal with in faith. Mm. You need an elder brother mm. to tell you and this not is what's coming. And not necessarily elder in terms of like somebody yeah. 55, uh -huh. somebody who might be two, three yeah, years yeah, old. And you're exactly. like, no, that's because not Because they, they were all close in age, but I think that that's what helps outcasts feel comfortable with their natural maturation that comes through each album. Okay. You take away the Dungeon family component, I don't think Outkast has the self-confidence to grow and evolve. Mm. They were given poetic license to be kids, to grow, to make mistakes, mm. and it was all love, it was all family. Woo! Shush, you need a little bit of sweet tea. I know, that. right? A little, 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 like, oh. little bit of sweet tea. So um, tell the folks how they can holler at you. What else you got going on at the Okay, moment? I got, um, you know, I'm glad that you got to talk to me yesterday. Um, we have Porch on Peach Street um, on Facebook. It's Porch on Peach Street. It's my radio show with Sister uh, Kimmy Minutes. Yep. Uh, I have that going on. I'm actually going to be implementing... Um, the from Afros and Shell Toys curriculum at another university here in the A. You All know right. what I'm saying? So you'll see that soon. I can't really say which one yet. Yep. But um, I'll definitely be implementing some from Afros and Shell Toys curriculum that deals with art, culture. So I'm going to be teaching Outcast, some Nikki Giovanni, um, and things of that nature. Uh, we're always looking to book, you know, Sweet Tea Ethics Conversations. So if you're a, a community center like Wickmall Park or uh, you Princeton University, just holler at us. But you can reach us at from afros to shell toes .com is the website the twitter is fat shell toes um and on facebook we are sweet tea ethics and um you know i just appreciate the space and the time to talk about it because it's a personal thing for me with outcast outcast is like a catfish po boy with extra hot sauce and then there's a drizzle of intellectual engagement. On top of it. <laughs> so whatever I can do for the brothers, and I, I just want to close by saying the perfect, the perfect way to look at Outkast. I remember I was with Big Rube. There was this big, I don't know which album was coming out. It might have been the greatest hits. And I had a chance to interact, you know, on a brief level with Andre. Mm -hmm. And what he was talking about is how he still 
how he felt about how about being a star. Mm. Like there was a fan there that was following him from gig to gig. Like he knew his fans that much. He's like, this sister and her mother follow me from place to place. Mm -hmm. But to see this man, an international superstar, along with his homeboy, still have enough humility to say, wow. Aww. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they feeling me from East Point? That shows the humble spirit of Outkast. Mm -hmm. And you know, don't sleep on Big Boy. No. That's what I was going to say, Coach. Don't sleep on Big Boy. The yin and the yang of Outkast is what makes them work. Big Boy is your uncle <laughs> on the corner. You know what I'm saying? He went to school. You just don't think he did because you're making value judgments about his Cadillac. Mm. He graduated. Went to Morehouse. BA in political science. That's Big Boy. So don't sleep on what Big Boy brings to the table. And it's both of their spirits and, hum and humbleness to work together while we have this one. Ooh, all right now, glow ray. I know. Hallelujah. So I appreciate you for coming and chopping up with us at the at the park. You know, one of the original ciphers in the south. I know, right? I play uh, ball right over there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Twisting a couple of ankles. So. Indeed. I'm Dr. Regina Bradley. This is Outcast the Conversation. We're gonna holler y'all next week. Y'all be easy. Hey.